Uh, my name is Christopher Sands. I'm director of the Center for Canadian Studies here at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, as we like to say, SICE. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to be here and to welcome you to today's discussion, which is also a book launch um, of Justin Trudeau and Canadian Foreign Policy. The book, available from Paul Grave Macmillan, is part of a series called Canada Among Nations, which is uh, an annual series going back 25 years or so. Um, our, our main speaker today is not only one of the editors of this edited volume, but has himself been an editor, uh, I think, five times altogether in a series that goes back 25 years. So uh, someone with uh, considerable engagement with the series and I don't know of any other series uh, or anything really like it that focuses on Canadian foreign policy and has done so with such durability over time. So it's really, for those of you who are interested in Canada, something to keep an eye on. It's a tremendous contribution for us academics um, and it's great that it's out there. I will also mention that uh, the series now is being published by Paul Grave Macmillan. Uh, Paul Grave Macmillan is also um, uh, running a series on Canada and international affairs, which is edited by, uh, among others, um, David Carment, who is here today, along with um, Meredith Lilly and Philippe Lagasse, the other co-editor with Norman Hilmer of this current <coughs> volume. Uh, they are all up at Carleton University at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, and. Uh, um, and I know David is also involved with uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Journal, uh, one of the mainstays of, of writing about Canadian foreign policy. So if you came to learn about Canadian foreign policy, you not only will have a tremendous presentation here, access to great material after, but also around you in the room are some of the people who really are the, the leading purveyors of the field. So it's, uh, it's an honor to have our speakers, but also an honor to have you all in the audience. Um, I want to uh, just very briefly introduce Norman Hilmer. Uh, for those of you who do not know, Norman Hilmer is among the great uh, Canadian diplomatic historians um, of, of our time. Uh, he, very, very well known. Those of you who follow Canada US will be familiar of books uh, such as uh, From Empire to Umpire, uh, one of his, his books on, uh, on, uh, on Canada-U.S. relations, Partners Nevertheless, which was a very good book on Canada-U.S. relations. He's written about Canada's relations with, uh, with Great Britain in Daughter of Empire. He's written about, uh, even uh, going back, Canada's relations with the Soviet Union, Nearly Neighbors. Um, very interesting. And for me, maybe uh, my favorite book is his most recent, uh, well, I guess until this one, uh, his most recent book, which is a biography of O.D. Skelton, one of the great Canadian uh, diplomats and thinkers of that golden age of Canadian foreign policy after, maybe it's not a golden age, I'll leave it to the expert to say, but it was after Canada gained control of its foreign policy uh, through the Statue of Westminster in 1931, and as Canada's Foreign Service, uh, then an external affairs department, really took shape. Um, Norman did his BA and MA at the University of Toronto and his PhD at Cambridge University in, in the UK. He, um, perhaps least notably, however, uh, was a professor of mine back in 1987. Uh, he, he must have been fresh out of something, school. Uh, I, I, I had the same haircut, but I was, uh, I was definitely a lot more awkward. But I, I can tell you, and the, I can't say this about every professor I've had, um, I still refer back to things I learned in his course on Canada-U.S. relations now that I live in the world of Canada-U.S. relations today. Not only are those things enduring truths that are still with me, um, but they're also uh, things that are, are just as insightful uh, as I try to understand the Trump administration. You know, they, they really bring back the essence of Canada-U.S. relations. So I've learned a lot from him and hopefully you will as well. I'm going to invite um, Norman to come to the podium and talk a little bit about the book, but before he does, I also want to introduce Richard Madden. Richard, for those of you who have access to CTV or who have been working with Canadian press and you know, uh, looking at the wire services, know Richard is one of the outstanding journalists who cover foreign and defense policy, international affairs. Uh, in 2016, he won the Ross Monroe Award from the Canadian Defense Association's Institute for outstanding coverage of international policy, um, which is a real honor. He is, in 
fact, a Carleton grad, which uh, make, I don't know if you ever took a course with Norman, but uh, he did graduate from Carleton, so at least there's the alumni tie there. Um, and also, interestingly, for someone to, uh, the reason I really wanted him to come and do this interview, uh, for someone who covers Washington, he's a Washington correspondent here in the CTV Bureau, he's remarkable in that he was born here. He was born in Georgia and uh, made his way to Canada, so he's truly somebody who works both sides, uh, understands, I think, a little bit more about both sides of the policy process. So I always find his reports insightful. Um, I, I'm really glad that he'll be conducting an interview with Norman after the formal presentation, and then we'll open up to audience Q&A. So with that, let me turn it over to Norman Hilmer. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chris. I'm grateful to you for a lot of things, but today for organizing this event. Uh, as he said, Chris is one of my former students who's gone on to great things. Uh, when we were ending, I guess, our first class together, you popped up in front of me, fresh of face, fresh of intelligence, fresh of enthusiasm and you haven't aged a day since. <laughs> I uh, come here today with uh, greetings and regrets from my co-editor, Philippe Lagasse. He'd be here if he could. I asked him if he had any other message to convey to you, and he said, um, buy the book. <laughs> now, we have, um, I think, 14 or 15 copies here. And um, the book is kind of expensive, it's $50, but we can give you a 20% discount, no tax, $40. And if that seems a lot of money to you, I, we should say that Paul Grave put an original price of $149 on it. It was worth every penny, but... <laughs> I'm going to say some words about the evolution of the book, and perhaps where Canadian-American relations lie at present. Although I was struck by our workshop and by our uh, visit to the Canadian Embassy yesterday, um, there seemed to be two words that everyone said about Canadian-American relations. Who knows? Now, Canadians always put it for the word Canadian first. They say Canadian-American relations. No doubt President Trump would say American-Canadian re relations, and he'd say a lot of worse things than that. Philippe and I were determined in the book to carry on the, Canadian, the Canada Among Nations tradition of coming at the country's international relations with a team of scholars, practitioners, graduate students and astute observers of contemporary affairs. We were particularly insistent on perspective of younger academics and indeed graduate students. We also sought to broaden out expertise to indigenous peoples, gender equality and feminist discourses, as well as critiques of what two of our authors call the illusions of liberal internationalism. In the beginning, we thought about situating each of the chapters in a deep historical context. We abandoned that idea early on because President Trump came along and he bore down heavily on us as he has done on the world. A theme emerged at any rate that put a heavy emphasis on the recent past although one that is not quite history yet. Comparisons and contrasts with the preceding Stephen Harper government became central to the way in which the 2017 authors interrogated their subjects. The contrasts were fewer than expected and the similarities were striking. The tone of foreign policy under Justin Trudeau has been altered, transformed dramatically can be doubted not in the least. But article after article in the book underlined 
the continuities between Harper and Trudeau. The pieces on trade, indigenous peoples, arms sales, China, and military policy all made the continuity point. Articles on climate change, refugees, and a feminist foreign policy noted difference. Now, if we'd taken the historical path, we might have found some comfort in the ways in which Canada and the United States have been out of alignment many times in the past, ever since the United States became Canada's indisputably closest ally. Long before that, it had been Canada's main rival, as Canadians know in their bones, but perhaps that's another story. Item. The John Kennedy and John Diefenbaker governments of the early 1960s were frequently at loggerheads. The Cuban Missile Crisis and the bitter controversy over Canadian acquisition of nuclear weapons soured the relationship. The President and the Prime Minister loathed one another. Item. In 1971, President Richard Nixon, proclaiming that the United States would be Uncle Sugar no more, imposed a 10% surtax on imports into the United States. The Canadian government of Pierre Trudeau sought an exemption and eventually obtained one, but not before Treasury Secretary John Connolly made an attempt to scuttle the Canada-US auto pact. My basic approach, said Connolly, is that foreigners are out to screw us. Our job is to screw them first. Sound familiar? <laughs> Item, the 1980s began with serious contention between the two countries over Canada's national energy program and differences about the environment and American foreign policy in Central and South America. Item, during the first term and a bit more of the George W. Bush administration, Canada and the United States were truly intolerant allies. Both countries were at fault. Two governments could cooperate on the smart border and the Afghanistan war because the 9-11 terror attacks on New York and Washington aligned agendas about those matters almost perfectly. Not so on ballistic missile defense and Iraq, where leadership stumbled and the relationship stalled badly over divisions that were compounded by flaws in approach, temperament, and judgment. In each of these cases, commentators spoke of the lowest point ever reached in the relationship's history. Yet in each of these cases, relations were bent, but they were not broken. In each of these cases, the President of the United States was, or could be convinced to be, well disposed towards Canada. In each of these cases, rules, rationality, and facts prevailed. Intolerance didn't prevail, didn't persist in a relationship where the two countries had so much history together, too much in common, and too much at stake. But the Trump administration, and not him alone, as Canada's NAFTA negotiators will attest, does seem very different from anything that we've seen. We tried in the book's introduction to capture the difference and the danger with the following words, which are the last words of the introduction. Commentaries about contemporary politics are always perilous, but they come, become downright impossible when the man in the White House is so unpredictable, so untethered by principle, so alienated from the system of which he is a part. As the first anniversary of Donald Trump's election to the presidency approaches, his approval ratings hover at record lows. Sadly, they're a bit higher now. Do I, do I, do you detect a bit of a bias? There? Scandal haunts his, haunts his administration, Republicans in Congress war with him and themselves, and doubts accelerate about his fitness for the presidency. Yet no one can underestimate or ignore the Trump effect. The Canadian government's foreign policy for all of Justin Trudeau's 
sunny multilateralism will largely succeed or fail in Washington. The age of Trudeau is handcuffed to the age of Trump. Sad to report, most of this remains true. Some of it is even more true. Now, without doubt, there is far more to North American politics than presidents and prime ministers. Our book puts a necessary emphasis on the underlying forces that are transforming geopolitics and the global economic order and taking America in on itself, Trump notwithstanding. Our article on Canada and the United States looks beyond President Trump to broader bilateral and international trends, and especially the issues thrown up by profound demographic and social change, fundamental alterations in the energy and climate systems, and emerging technologies that are disrupting and transforming the domestic and global economies. The authors call for strategic foresight and long-term planning with money and investment to match, and they are not alone in our book for doing so. Still, still, in conclusion, people matter. To be particular, presidents of the United States matter for good and ill. Their personalities can trump all else. And shall we say the president holder, the present holder of the office brings a most peculiar temperament to the job. It usually seems to me that the presidency has real limits given the constraints that are meant to prevent excess. But these are not usual times. When my wife and I were last week far away in the Baltic Sea sailing around, a long time, it was a very lovely week, but President Trump was always there. We couldn't escape him. We tried. <laughs> we couldn't do it. None of us can. Thank you. So how do you really feel about Donald Trump? <laughs> um, he, uh, he disgusts me and he scares me. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, this morning I, I read the first two chapters of this book. Um, and just a quick little story I'll share with you. Before I moved here, I covered Parliament Hill in Canada. Um, and I covered the 2015 election. And we'd switch campaign planes. And I was with Tom Mulcair the first couple weeks. We switched off to Stephen Harper. And then we went uh, on Trudeau's plane. And unlike Harper and Mulcair, which had chartered uh, Air Canada Airbus planes, Trudeau's plane was an old Air Transat plane. And he was a third party. He was languishing in polls. And no one was really taking him seriously. Uh, his policy proposals, uh, he was criticized for spending a lot, throwing Canada into deficit, and they thought he could promise the moon because he's not going to win. So fast forward, we're in Summerside PEI, beautiful day, and he walks out, and thousands of people were there, thousands. And this is Prince Edward Island, small little province. And he was part celebrity, people were curious, and he walked in there, he didn't say anything uh, with deep substance, but what he did do is afterwards, he stayed and shook hands with everybody. And you could tell right away, if he didn't like his politics, he loved people. He loved being around people. He loved taking the selfies. The next day, <clears throat> we fly from PEI, we go to Vancouver. Harper unveils a fiscal policy. Uh, Mulcair unveils something for seniors, I believe. Trudeau just wanted to climb Grouse Mountain in Vancouver, wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And we were realizing there's no policy here with this guy. But that video of him climbing, it was shared all over social media, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. People were just tweeting it. And that's when I realized, and I was calling my desk saying, Trudeau's captured something. He's captured this optimism uh, that Canadians wanted. It was a change election. We all knew it. And that's when we started to see support uh, collapsing around the NDP and starting to coalesce around the Liberals. I'm really looking forward to reading the rest of this book. Uh, especially as Canada ramps up to a federal election next year. This could be viewed as possibly a, perhaps a political report card or reality check uh, where he's failed, where he's succeeded, um, and the Trudeau brand 
the impact it's having, whether it's a good or bad thing. I'm really excited to read this, and it just brought me back. I just wanted to share that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you just, you had this line that, that I really, uh, that I thought was profound when you were speaking, when you said, the age of Trudeau is handcuffed to the age of Trump. Um, I think I know what you mean, but I'm hoping you can expand on that. Well, when Trudeau was elected, he said those famous words, Canada's back. And Canada seemed to be back. Off he went to the G7, off he went to COP21, Paris climate talks, um, off he went to the Commonwealth meeting in, in Malta. And, uh, and the Philippines was, when he was mobbed well, like a yes, One was, Direction it was, member. Yeah. It was uh, glamour galore. Yeah. And um, and he was the shining he was the shining star, and uh, I think on the first page of the book we cite the Economist magazine, which yeah. shows Canada um, with a, a smile and a hockey stick, yeah. and contrasts that with the people around the world who want to drop bridges and turn in on themselves. And you also cited the Washington Post saying he's the anti-Trump. Well, true, yeah, and. And so that was the the early Trudeau was going to be the great multilateralist, the the liberal internationalist that would harken back to his dad and harken back to Lester Pearson. And then along came Trump, and what could be done except to put all of the energy or almost all of the energy of Canadian foreign policy into the Canadian-American relationship. So down we went to the United States, to the states, to the cities, to, to the governors, to the Congress, uh, in an attempt to somehow influence the United States and prevent Trump from implementing his very public promises. And that's what's happened ever since. And there has been very little multilateralism in Canadian foreign policy ever since, and a whole lot of bilateralism, and, um, well, handcuffs. We're handcuffed to the United States. We always are, but we but really are now. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting is part of that charm offensive that, that was sort of nicknamed, Katie Telford, who is uh, Trudeau's chief of staff, uh, developed a very close friendship with Jared Kushner. They text each other. And there was this, we did this story, because I know all of you watch CTV National News. Mm -hmm. uh, I broke the story that, it, this is before John Kelly, uh, when it was Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon, the early Trump people. Uh, <coughs> Telford wanted to have a call between Trudeau and Trump. When Bannon and Reince Priebus, when they all left the room, she put in, he, he, he texted her saying, make this call now, call president and this call happened Katie was driving home uh, and the text came in she had to pull her car over into a parking lot patch into the PMO switchboard to speak with the president and it's that relationship with Katie Telford and Jared Kushner that seemed to keep this relationship uh, to keep it going but I think things have changed recently which brings me to my next question you mentioned this charm offensive uh, cabinet ministers going to the states going to the cities talking about the importance of the Canada US relationship when it comes to trade how is that relationship working now? Is that, has that strategy been successful in your mind? Who knows? How would you grade think, it? Yes. Well, I think I and almost everybody else would grade it as an A. Perhaps, perhaps up until the, um, the, um, the G7 meeting in Charlevoix and, the, and uh, Trudeau's press conference. and. And um, Chuck Dornan said uh, yesterday that he thought that perhaps Trudeau could have been a little more polite and he should have realized that there were 20 plus TV sets on Air Force One. Nevertheless, um, Canadians, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've established a country based on the idea, as you well know, um, that we're not going to be dependent on the United States, or we're not going to feel dependent on the United States. And um, we can only be pushed too far, and the Prime Minister can only be pushed too far. If, um, 
we go by what we saw at the Canadian Embassy yesterday. There's a there's a very experienced team mm -hmm. of people, the ambassador and all of his heads of department, who are working on this thing very very carefully. And um, as one of them told us, uh, there are two things happening in the relationship. What always happens, which is cooperation across departments and agencies and and um, cross-border uh, collaboration in, in a thousand different ways. And then there's this Trump administration, which speaks with many tongues. Uh -huh. And uh, so how, 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 how could you know? How can you know what is in the mind of Donald Trump? And as George Packer said in the New Yorker this week, um, that's where American foreign policy resides, uh -huh. in the head. Of Donald Trump. Just to go on the other side, though, I don't know if you anyone saw Trump's speech yesterday in South Carolina, where he almost imitated Trudeau, that, and he calls him Justin, and I think that's sort of a, a new tactic he's using. Um, as an aside, should you be surprised by this, though? I mean, everyone was surprised. I think we can all agree that Trump won, but he promised a nationalist agenda. He promised to blow up trade pacts. He even promised to uh, distance the United States from allies. Uh, to, to revisit this. I mean, are you surprised that we're seeing this coming out from Trump? Should we not have expected it? I've based a whole academic career on the idea that, um, that ultimately, as I just said, that history and interests trump everything in the final analysis. We have our troubles, we have our extraordinary troubles, but we, we always manage to get along. And... Um, and this is this may be yet another item in a speech I give five <laughs> years from now, but it may be something a good deal more. And everybody thought during the the 2016 presidential campaign that there was another Trump who would emerge after he was elected, and uh, that person hasn't emerged because, of course, that person doesn't exist. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, and, and it, we're not surprised by the tone of Justin Trudeau, optimistic and, 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 um, and inclusive. But we are continually surprised by just how low this president will go. And whether it will translate itself into policy, it's already translated itself into the NAFTA negotiations. And there's a... There's a Trump with a brain in the USTR, uh, Lighthizer, who is uh, every bit as uh, combative as John Connolly was and as Donald Trump now is. So, yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, there's an old saying that you hear here in Washington that uh, President Trump loves being president. He just hates the presidency. Um, you mentioned a couple examples. You mentioned, uh, well, I think we can agree that right now is a pretty low point in Canada-U.S. relations. You mentioned Nixon. You mentioned uh, Diefenbaker, uh, Nixon Trudeau and Diefenbaker. Where do you think this ranks? Is this worse or is it on par with what we saw in the late 60s, early 70s? Well, I think it's worse because it's not clear that in the end those three things that I mentioned are, are going to prevail. Rules, rationality, and what's the third? I, whenever I do this with students, I say I have three things to say, and then I can't remember what they are. Uh, <laughs> rules, rationality, and facts. And uh, we can't be sure. Uh -huh. We can't be sure. And um, there is this idea, the, these, these, those three words, which have found their way into the vocabulary even more than ever, zero-sum game. Uh -huh. um, the president wants to win. He wants to be seen to be win, winning. And he's not one of those leaders who wants to make you feel as if you have also won. The Art of the Deal. The Art of the Deal, which, of course, is a book that he didn't write. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I sort of asked you this question earlier, but I, it, in your mind, based on what you're seeing now and the trajectories or unpredictable trajectories, do you think NAFTA's dead? No, I don't. Um, I'm a little surprised, um, as Laura McDonald, is Laura here? Um, 
as Laura McDonald said uh, yesterday, that the the multinationals aren't aren't stepping up. Um, I'm a little surprised that there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of uh, resistance yet in in Congress. Um, a little surprised that the Republicans toe the Trump line quite quite as much as they do. However, um, and, and we certainly all thought that we were going to wake up to a tweet uh, a few weeks ago that said it's over. Um, but I, I think governors, um, 35 states have Canada as their leading, uh, leading trading partner. There are all kinds yeah. of interdependencies which we hope are going to eventually uh, matter. <coughs> Now, can it be that the president has heard enough from enough people that he is hesitating? Uh, and after the negotiations carry on, they're, they're um, not very productive. Uh, not a whole lot has been done or an awful lot of uh, chapters are left to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. Um, but the big ones, right? Yeah. Incidentally, yeah. Um, I'm told uh, by people inside the negotiations that Jared Kushner is a is a positive force, and that he does his best to keep Lighthizer in some kind of uh, in some kind under some kind of control. So I think there are, there's enough there to mm -hmm. to be hopeful. Mm -hmm. But you ask me if I'd be surprised. I won't be surprised <laughs> anymore if NAFTA uh, doesn't succeed. Let's look at the other side of the border. Uh, there's unpredictability here in the United States. In Canada, it's had a completely different effect where Trudeau's had everyone rallying around him. I believe there was a professor whose name we shall not name who predicted that uh, Trudeau could call a snap election uh, if, uh, if he sees that there's a crisis uh, with NAFTA. Do you, do you agree with uh, this young man? <laughs> I totally put you on the spot right there, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's all right. He's put me on the spot several times in the last couple of days. Asked me yesterday in front of the ambassador whether the ambassador was in the book. And <laughs> the ambassador is not in the book. <clears throat> uh, if I'd known, I would have put him in the book. Um, Bottom line, could you see Trudeau yes, calling an early I election? I could see it, but I'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I read the polls were that they that his approval rating went up considerably, but liberals' poll numbers didn't particularly shift. So um, I, I've always said that um, opposition leader, um, the opposition leader is is um, pretty ineffectual, but he could just lay low and allow which, Trump, which one, Trudeau Sheer or uh, Sheer Singh? Yes, okay. Yes. Um, that he could just lay low and, and time might bring him uh, victory. Sure. Because after all, one of the big themes of the book is all those promises exactly. that have yet to be fulfilled. So, which leads me to my next question. At this point, as we Canada hits an election in 2019, what, how would you grade Trudeau based on his performances, or based on his uh, promises vis-a-vis -vis what, he's, what he's kept? Overall or in foreign policy? Overall. Uh, B minus. Uh, there are those big, big promises: uh, electoral reform. Uh, his promises on uh, the indigenous agenda have been. Um, I mean, he's been pretty, pretty slow on that file. Um, uh, it, here's the problem with Trudeau: he made these big promises, these big promises, because he was a third-party candidate and he was unlikely to be right. elected. He now has to live with those promises, and they're. They're big promises. They're lofty ones. Well, yeah. the pot legalization, they managed to get that through. Yeah, they did. And, and uh, he has a record. So back to your first question, I don't think he'll call a snap election. Uh, and I think he will be reelected. But um, a lot of the, the bloom has gone off the rose. And that's inevitable given all the all the expectations that he that he um, uh, that he generated right. in the Canadian body politic. So, if we were to take a significant pay cut and advise the prime minister, uh, what advice would you give him 
specifically Canada-U.S. relations on how to manage this president? Do what you're doing, I think. I should tell you that um, in the mid-1990s, I um, was uh, working as a kind of quiet advisor to, the, uh, to Prime Minister Kretschmer. And um, I, he didn't ask me, but his staff asked me whether he ought to call an election. What year was this? This was 1997. Seven. Yes. And, um, and I said, no, not a good idea. Not, it's, it's too soon. Uh, he didn't take my advice. He was right. <laughs> and the thing about historians, mm -hmm. and it differs from political scientists, you see, political scientists are always making these predictions, and they, it's pretty safe to, to make these predictions, um, because nobody really remembers. Um, <laughs> but, um, but historians, uh, we, mm -hmm. we have the fastness of, right. of the past. Do you mind if we stay in the 90s for a moment? <laughs> uh, because as you know, in the 90s, there was a phenomenon of the Reform Party that you know, talked about populism, alienation, forgotten Canadians, the West wants in. There are some parallels to Trump tapping into that in the United States as well, that uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities about you know, stoking populism, stoke, fueling a campaign based on anger. Do, do you see any parallels? Well, I guess I do. And, and um, again, as, as the workshop um, participants mentioned, um, populism in Western Canada is not, is not unique to the 1990s. It's been around a long time. Um, but a whole I movement was formed by that. Uh, Preston Manning led reform. And he was a pretty respectable dude. He was, um, he, he had his rhetoric, but he also had responsibility. And, and um, I thought a pretty, he was a pretty admirable opposition leader. The Reform Party, though, had an anti-immigrant cast to it. And any political party in Canada, provincial or federal, that has an anti-immigrant cast to it, whether it's the 1990s or it's 2018, will be defeated. Okay. So jumping ahead now to 2020, uh, you've got, in a hypothetical world, because we have no idea what's going to happen, let's just say Trudeau wins 2019, Trump wins in 2020. How do you see this relationship either changing or more friction? Um, well, it would be nice if you just leave us alone and, uh, and concentrate on, uh, on Europe or, or on Putin or China or some other place. But um, Trump it just celebrates friction. It's, it's what he does for a living. And it's been successful. Uh, I looked up his approval ratings this morning, you know, which sit in the early 40s. And a couple of weeks ago, we were as high as, as 45%. Well, and among this Republicans, is, he's at 90. Well, this is, this, is, yeah. uh, this is re election territory. And it's hard to see a Democrat who can defeat him as we sit in, in 2018. So uh, I think we have to think about the long game. And I also think that um, uh, we're, there's always going to be friction of one kind and another. It's not clear that NAFTA will be. Re, won't still be being re, renegotiated in 2019. Um, those negotiators are moving slowly, and they seem to um, they seem to be allowed to be doing so. Uh, everything is uncertain. Things are always uncertain, but particularly so now, and um, this has enormous impact on on business and on yep. the Canadian body politic more more generally, but. If Trump continues to be Canada's enemy, then um, does that Canadian help Trudeau? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, so we talked about how, how much time do we have, Chris? We have another forty minutes. <laughs> okay. I'm uh, hoping. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I no, I, I mean I can there, keep going. I, I just have a story to do later on. Uh, a little look of desperation went over. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and 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 by all means, I'd love to hear from 
of you because because everybody in the room knows something uh, more about something than I do. So I'll just wind down quickly because I wanted to get into to foreign policy. Is Trump uh, had uh, not just Canada, I mean, uh, Germany and uh, other NATO allies talking, uh, demanding that they pay more of their GDP, 2% GDP, to military funding. Uh, he's ripped into Trudeau for that. He's also done that with Merkel and, uh, and a few other NATO countries as well. Is that, is that the wrong approach? Because after all, all these countries committed to it and they're not living up to it, including Canada. Uh, the truth is that Canada has been a free rider in NATO uh, for almost all of the years. Um, in the early 50s, we were a major player. We had a big military. We had, uh, we had an aircraft carrier. Um, and uh, then long about the middle 50s, um, the uh, strategic environment changed. We... Um, Started to pay less attention to uh, Europe and, yeah. and more attention to North America. Kind of um, and then in the 60s, along came the welfare state. We just couldn't spend the money on the military that we used to be able to do. So we've been criticized in NATO and from within NATO ever since the mid 50s mm -hmm. for, um, for not spending enough. And the equation has always been that we would do just enough mm -hmm. to get by. And Chris has had some interesting things to say about how uh, Canada might uh, rename its, its, uh, some of its contributions to security so that it's clear that we are spending and we are doing more than we appear to be spending and doing. But um, I regret to say that Trump has a case here. And the Trudeau brand, uh, their direction of Canada's military, how does that contrast to the Harper brand? Um, well, it's going to be very different, isn't it? We're right. going to spend far more money. We're going to spend money on cyber. We're going to spend money on space. Uh, but we're going to do it after the 2019 election. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it may be that, um, like his father, he will confound people and spend more on the military than the conservatives, but he has yet to do so. And so the, it's not simply on spending, but on uh, uh, overseas commitments. The Harper and the Trudeau defense policies do not appear to be very different. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a sort of a saying in Ottawa before I moved that uh, the Harper government and the Trudeau government are pretty much similar, just Trudeau does it with a smile. Uh, yeah. Uh, we can take questions uh, from, from you folks. Uh, one of our super students, uh, Teddy, has the, uh, has the mic. So just signal that you'd like to send it out to you. Oh, and introduce yourself. So that Is this working? Hi, I'm Dwight Mason. I used to serve in the Foreign Service and our embassy in Ottawa and later with the PJBD. Um, the Charm Offensive. It strikes us that this is a one-off. I don't see any institutionalization of this. I don't see any increase in posts in this country just to really give this some staying power. And it seems to me that given the depth of the relationship between the two countries, there's an awful lot to be exploited there. And so I'm really surprised that the government of Canada hasn't increased its posts, you know, by a factor of about 10. I mean, look at Mexico with 35 consulates. Not that it's doing them much good at the moment, but nevertheless, all these... 33 states, they're all ready for work, you know, and I, I'm very surprised about this. And that leads me to another question, Mr. Chairman. What do you think the condition of the Canadian Foreign Service is now? Um, we hear different stories down here that it's doing not so well. But it's, That's a really good point. Uh, good to see you, Dwight. And uh, Dwight was one of the contributors to an earlier Canada Among Nations. Well-known <laughs> We've been hearing these stories for years and years. Uh, the best people go into the Foreign Service, but they often go off someplace else. Um, it's, I think pay has, is better. Um, I think working conditions are better. But the Trudeau government has invested no new money in the Foreign Service. Uh, the, for the Trudeau government has um, invested no new money in development assistance. We're going to have a feminist foreign policy, uh, but we're 
we're simply going to reallocate some of the very few dollars that we give to development anymore. Um, I think we sit at about a third of the uh, percentage of gross national income that we devoted to development during the Trudeau years or at the height of the Trudeau years in the mid-70s. Um, so again, the point was made well yesterday at the, at the workshop that these investments are just not being made. And the uh, uh, military is your field. And uh, those investments are, are to come later. We're going to recapitalize the military. We're going to get new planes, but we're going to do it after the election. Well, nobody believes any of that. Because we know the procurement process in Canada. Well, yeah. That's a really good point. The Foreign Service, though, really does have, um, and, and you could see it at the Canadian Embassy yesterday, really does have the best, well, the best people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still, I heard that there was no um, I don't know that, but I'm surprised. <laughs> uh, Laura, yeah, Laura, is that the case? I don't think so. Yeah. I'm going to give you some gossip. Uh, so Christy Clark, the former Premier of BC, her uh, chief of staff, I believe, Ben Chin, uh, after she was defeated, he was looking for work. He goes to his good friend, Gerald Butts, saying, can you help me out? And he was going to hire him as a chief of staff to the ambassador. Word got out, uh, first reported on CTV National News, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> that he was, he was about to land this job, and suddenly that was spiked. So that, was, that would have been one more addition um, to the Foreign Service in, in, in D.C. He since landed nicely as uh, the Chief of Staff to the Finance Minister. Uh, you've done well in D.C. It's my concern for the rest of the country. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, that charm offensive, the, the one thing I have noticed, if, if it means anything, they haven't increased the staffing levels. However, um, the consulate, say, in Atlanta or Texas, uh, Where's the other one? Is it Colorado? No. What's the one southwest? Is it Denver? Denver. Denver. That's the one. They're speaking out more. They're also being proactive uh, ahead of, of in the midst of this NAFTA negotiation. There's no conflict at all with the capital of New York State. They have one in New York City. Well, that's not the capital. Yeah. That's not where the government actually is. You know, same thing with Los Angeles. It's great for movies, but the capital is in Sacramento, and that's where the, the government is. I don't. I think these people they're in the wrong places. Uh, that's a great point. So, Michael Redmond, a uh, student here at SAIS, and uh, I was just wondering if you think, you know, the Canadian democracy will prove to be um, a lot more resilient than the U.S. and other democracies to you know, some question. of the pressures from, you know, fake news or internal divisions within the country and if so, you know why that is. That's a good question. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the resiliency of both the Canadian and American democracy. Um, I, 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 as a historian, I've studied a lot of American history, and, uh, and um, as my, my friend Dr. Skelton used to say, um, Americans go in for 100% Americanism. Uh, they're, they're, they're passionate. Leonard Cohen said, cradle of the best and the worst. And, um, and we have some of the worst now, but we have lots of the best. Um, we'll survive Trump. And uh, I think um, the great challenge is, to, is, is, is in the coarsening of the, uh, of, uh, of the body politic. It's so easy now to go down the bad path uh, because the leader is doing it. But hmm. I can foresee a, a, a woman president in 2020 who will, uh, who will take us all back to, to whence we came. But there is an ugliness. Um, 
the the United States is such a such a, an enormous um, bubbling, thriving um, place of of lows and highs. It always has been. Uh, in the 1930s, there was the demagogue Huey Long. There were there were lots of other demagogues, and um, and we survived them. Uh, I think we'll be fine. But uh, it's, a, it's a sad, unusual, and difficult time. David. So uh, it, the impression you get is that it's all bad news for Canada. I'm curious if your contributors agree with that assessment in that this is a president who has been accused of doing a lot of bad things, and perhaps he has uh, done things that are illegal. But he hasn't taken this country into war, <clears throat> and uh, there's no foreseeable war in the near future that he was, he's going to take the United States into. He's not dragged his allies into war either. For me, that's a big plus, unlike the two previous presidents. <clears throat> um, and so how do, we, how do we judge this man based on his, his desire to upset the apple cart, but at the same time doesn't appear to be wedded to conventional American strategies of intervention, uh, the use of force, compellence, and so on. Even if a lot of what he says is bluster and not, perhaps even nonsensical when it comes to negotiating with North Korea, I see an outcome here that is positive. Uh, he's talking, whereas I, no one could imagine that Obama or Bush would have sat down with the leader of North Korea. Uh, they were too wrapped up in the, the thinking of the time, which is you had to do certain things and you had to constrain yourself. This guy did something that was weird. He actually committed himself and he opened himself up to being criticized for it. And the press has had, you know, is basically now driven by the, 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 the Trump agenda and what he's going to do wrong next. And uh, But what I see is... Uh, the academic community also buying into that kind of premise that this guy is only capable of bad, bad faith thinking, if you will. John Foster Dulles, as, as they used to say, Dulles looked at the Soviet Union. If they did something positive, he said, you can't trust those Russians. And if they did something negative, he said, see, those Russians are up to no good. Um, that's how we approach Donald Trump. The, what, no matter what he does, he's incapable of good acts. I'm not, uh, I'm suggesting here that there's something that he's doing that is good for America, and it may be strategic, and it's not short-term, and we better get used to it, uh, that it, this is the new normal, that instability is the new normal, crisis management is the new normal. I'd be interested in hearing some responses to that from, from you. Well, you know, I, I would just like to, if, if you don't mind, I agree with you on several things. He, because Trump was elected to basically blow up the system. And he has brought, as he calls it, the forgotten men and women of America. He's brought them to the forefront. And his approach, well, it, as you said, it can be nonsensical and completely unpredictable. He has, he has put a lot of domestic issues on the top of the agenda that previous presidents haven't done. You'll recall both... Uh, Candidate Obama, candidate Hillary Clinton, going back to 2008, promised to blow up NAFTA as well. That didn't, nothing came of that. Trump was following through on these things, and a lot of his supporters are ignoring his rhetoric, and they are looking at what he is doing. And here in the U.S., he has stacked the courts, which his base loves. He has brought in a new Supreme Court justice, which is evening or if not tipping the scales, at, at the Supreme Court, his base loves. The economy appears to be improving. His base loves that. And he's created, at his rallies, uh, this, uh, this atmosphere which is electric. I, I, I was on his campaigns. I, I spent pretty much the last month of the election in Florida, uh, which is a, it's Florida. Um, but you would go to a Hillary Clinton campaign and you would walk out not knowing what she's promising, other than I'm not this guy. You could walk 
out of a Trump rally, ask any of his supporters, I could ask any of you guys here, what are three things that he promised during the election? We can all name them, right? Um, and and he, is, he has carried through on an agenda uh, that he has promised. And when he was threatening war with North Korea, uh, using these inflammatory words, he ended up sitting down with that guy. And I agree, he's doing stuff that previous presidents haven't done. So I think what, what is causing his administration chaos is the uh, dysfunction at the White House, the lack of a cohesive message. He contradicts himself on his own facts, um, and he, he's petty and provocative. You see that on his Twitter feeds. He, he attacked Jimmy Fallon. You know, you know, and last night at his rally in South Carolina, uh, he mocked, he almost imitated the Prime Minister of Canada. He listed all these celebrities from Kimmel to, uh, who's the other Jimmy? Uh, Fallon to Kimmel. Um, his ratings on The Apprentice, that's what sours a lot of people, but his base loves it. So, so yes, I agree with you, but he is also his own worst enemy as well. There was something in the back. Oh, um, an expat Canadian here. Um, I, I do agree with this gentleman here as well. And I also am hearing a bit of rigidity on the part of Canada. I mean, this is like a giant chess match. Uh, and you've got to be thinking, you know, steps ahead. And I see Canada saying, you know, it's not like it used to be. Uh, instead of how are we going to find a strategy to deal with this president who may be with us for many more years. What is Canada doing to uh, anticipate and, and think ahead about how to deal with this man? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to do. Um, the uh, negotiators, the NAFTA negotiators uh, from the Canadian side and from the Mexican side arrive at talks time and time and time again, and um, they're met with rigidity. They're met with with um, people across the table who, who are unwilling to bend. Uh, we have a long history in Canada of good trade negotiating. We, we're good at this. And, uh, and we've used all of our wits and we've used rules uh, to, to uh, uh, guide our, our uh, negotiations. But this is, this is very hard to do. Uh, uh, David talks about a strategy. I don't think that Trump has a strategy. I think he has tactics. And I think these tactics change from day to day to day. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't know whether he's going to blow up NAFTA. Um, and, I, and I don't find that um, a president who, who appeals to the worst in us uh, is, is um, something in any way to be admired. Now, I do agree with David that upsetting the apple, apple cart is perfectly legitimate. It would be interesting to see the same ideas come from somebody who could um, inspire some kind of admiration on the part of his allies as well as on the part of his enemies. Um, so I, I um, you know, I. I applaud uh, the denuclearization of, North Korea, of, of the Korean Peninsula if it's about to happen. But um, without preparation, Trump walked into that meeting. As far as we know, nothing much came of it except a, uh, an, an American concession. And uh, in the meantime, he slapped Kim Jong-un on the back and said what a fine fellow he was. Um, if we were writing history and talking about um, the Duke of Windsor or a 
another British visitor or two or three to Hitler in the 1930s. We might look back on that with, with some um, dismay and disdain. And we might, 20 or 30 years from now, um, as Kim Jong-un's son continues to um, threaten us with nuclear weapons, we might look back on Trump as, as very foolish. Now, if Trump succeeds, then, uh, then the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, I think Canadians will be the first to applaud. But it's very difficult to deal with a person who, um, who, who changes his mind every five seconds. And if it's, if it's a tactic and if it's a strategy, well, then I applaud it. But I, uh, I, I, I don't give Trump as much credit as David does. Can I just rewind five, about yeah. three minutes ago? Because you said something about the first woman president in 2020. And I meant to ask, who do you think that is? Well, Ivanka? I, <laughs> <laughs> well, if they truly are America's new royal family, then, uh, then uh, Trump could just hand off to her, couldn't he? Uh, just, but when you said uh, first woman president, yes, like, who are you? I, who are you I, was, uh, I was hoping. Um, I, I think the, uh, that Kamala Harris is... The, is is a, leading, is a leading candidate. I would love to see Elizabeth Warren, but Elizabeth Warren couldn't win the presidency. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure Kamala Harris could beat Trump. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I, I'm a Democrat. I'm, I'm a liberal. So, uh, so those are my biases. Interesting. So I, I have two questions for you. And I feel bad stealing the podium at, at my own event, but I just have two, two questions. One of the themes from the book that you brought out, Norman, was the Illusions of Liberal Internationalism. And you, you could probably take that title and put it on a foreign affairs article and discuss Trump foreign policy as well. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your, how your authors, how your book discussion reflected on the illusions of liberal internationalism from the Canadian perspective. What is it that you're re-examining that may not have been durable? Um, I have a second question, which is really more to get you as an historian to think about it. I, I was thinking about um, Diefenbaker Kennedy and, and Nixon Trudeau and some of the tensions of the past, but they didn't occur in a social media world where everything's happening right out in front of us. Uh, journalists usually give us the first draft of history, historians give us a second draft with a little more data, which is great, but for us as citizens, we enjoy both, but, but you're the mediating factor, and now there's no intermediation. We, we often see it all hanging out, and if there's a fight between the president and the prime minister, we don't wait for your book. It, it, it happened on Twitter two seconds ago. So in that world, how does that change the work of an historian? How does it change the work of journalism? Um, because you're competing with a narrative that's out there before um, you've even had a chance to look at the numbers or, or see what the story really is. So mm. two questions. Mm. Richard? Uh, there was a great, uh, it was a podcast, I think, or, or I read it, I don't remember, but there was an argument made that Nixon would have easily survived Watergate if it happened now. Because back then, there was no Twitter, there was no Fox News, uh, he could have weathered the storm. And as, as a journalist, uh, I, I get questioned from, and people are handing me information that uh, it's, it's just, it's not even true. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, on Facebook, there were reporters who, who I'm friends with on their Facebook page. There was a fake tweet from Catherine McKenna. Uh, it said Catherine, McQuen Catherine McKenna, and it, it ripped into Jason Kenney. And it, it wasn't even her. It wasn't true, but it was being shared on Facebook. And could this be a bizarre preview of 2019 in Canada with some bizarre tweet that was circulated, a fake tweet, uh, and, and that's forming people's opinions. It, like, it, it's, it's quite dangerous that this is happening because no one knows who to trust anymore, and people have picked their corners, they're living in silos, and nobody's having discussions. And it used to be, and in Canada, still overall it exists, uh, there's, a, there's a fact. It's just, everyone agrees on the same fact. And Trudeau, at the time, was Tom Mulcair and Harper would all just have a different idea. How, much, how big is the deficit? What's the national debt? Uh, what is the average tax rate? Uh, Trudeau was pinned down repeatedly. When you say middle class, define it. And everyone could agree. But here, and even in Canada, the goalposts are changing, and that nobody knows who or what to believe anymore. And that's a real erosion 
uh, of a pillar of, I'm, I'm sounding like an academic now, but that, that's an erosion of a pillar of democracy. And when you start eroding this foundation, it, it is so incredibly dangerous. And you see what's being reported out there. Um, I, you know, you, you, you can only do what you're going to do. Second, second thing I'll say, and this is what I struggle with as a journalist here, is, so I went to Carleton, but I couldn't get into journalism school. Okay, uh, uh, I took political science, but um, as journalists, you you are supposed to give both sides, right? Okay, so when you have a presidential tweet that is so completely wrong, and you think, can you call it a lie if maybe he's not informed? Can you call it maybe he had bad advice? or maybe it was an error, you, you constantly try to give benefit of a doubt if you try to get the other side. And so now what I'm finding is that a lot of the journalists here are sort of evolving. Is, for example, um, President Trump falsely said this. Before you would say, he said this, but that's not true because. And then you lose people. So you, you just, it, we have to change how we report information, but at the same time have to live with this reality that there are so many other outlets out there. Uh, um, just one last thing. Uh, so I go to the White House press briefings as, as often as I can. And that has completely changed. Uh, it used to be, so on the front row, all the seats are assigned. Front row are the network guys and Bloomberg. Uh, the second row is the AP, I, or sorry, not AP. Uh, anyway, the second row is like the New York Times and stuff like that, and it just goes back and back. Uh, but the people who are getting questions, less and less the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, it's Breitbart, the Daily Caller, uh, very partisan outlets. And what, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you compete with that? Well, you just do the best you can, but you also have to recognize that there are other voices out there. So that's not easy, exactly. The highest compliment I can give you, Richard, is you don't sound the least bit like an academic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, snap, as the kids would say. Yeah. Uh, the, the writing of history is, is, is so hard because we base it on evidence. And the evidence is going to be much harder to find in one respect. Um, and this is made more difficult because the access to information laws in Canada are... Um, are way outdated and, and uh, difficult to manage and public servants have a lot of incentive to cover up rather than, rather than to show the public and, and show journalists and show um, academics their, their work. Um, so in, in one sense, evidence is harder to find and then in another sense, there's just too much evidence out there now. So mm -hmm. it's going to be very much more difficult to, to uh, to write history, so we're going to rely on the political scientists to write the second draft, and then historians will be able to write perhaps the third draft when the, when the time comes. As to liberal internationalism, um, every government of Canada since 1945 has been liberal internationalists, even going back to the late days of McKinsey King with the possible exception of the Stephen Harper government, but even it, in its own way, engaged the world. Uh, that's because um, we, for a long time, were British and American, and we could balance the two. When the British fell, um, we had only multilateralism to balance American power and influence. And so we, we have played that game. Uh, multilateralism combats bilateralism, safety in numbers, and it's a it's it's an old sounding game, but it's the Canadian game, and we continue to play it. So liberal internationalism, good. <laughs> <laughs> so can I can I just uh, just follow up? You, you mentioned Harper, uh, because it's, and it's in your book too. The Harper's. Uh, was focused on, on international trade was its priority. Oh, yes. He went all around the world trying to get in on trade deals, whether the TPP or 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 others. So, well. so, so when you said that, what I took from you is that the, under the Harper government, it was a bit uh, more insular. Uh, did I read that? Did uh, I listen uh, that wrong? No, I think it was more combative. 
I, yeah. I think that's, uh, he saw good and evil. Uh, he might have gotten all, along a little bit better with Trump, not terribly much better, but, but uh, uh, had a, a Manichaean wor uh, worldview. Uh, there, was, there was the good and there was the evil. And, um, and he was going to stand up for what was good. So is Trudeau not like that? Uh, no, he smiles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and pats you on the back. And, and, um, and tone is, is vitally important in foreign policy. Um, A.J.P. Taylor, the great historian, said that foreign policy consists mostly of saying what you're going to do. And, um, and Canadian governments, with the exception of Harper, uh, have been Pearsonian. You know, they have, they have sought to embrace the world as a way of, um, of furthering Canadian interests. And when Trudeau Papa became Prime Minister of Canada in 1968, he immediately set out to uh, denounce Pearsonianism. Um, only to find that, in the end, he was as Pearsonian as the rest, with his mm -hmm. world tour mm -hmm. to damp down nuclear tensions and the rest. Hmm. Interesting. That was very academic-y. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of that, um, one of your uh, predecessors, Roger Smith uh, came. Oh, I know Roger. Yeah. Uh, yes, came to my study, and and he said, and this these were in day in the days when I could believe this. Uh, I I said that uh, Canadian American relations could be understood as a train going down a track, and every so often a president and a prime minister would get on, and either push the brake or push the accelerator, but that train was going to come on down so complexly. Canadian-American relationship, that train was going to come down the track no matter what. And Roger said, great, say it in 15 seconds. And now, and now you're telling me, say it in eight. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say that, but yeah, eight or seven seconds now. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Barry Rape from the University of Michigan. I'd like to push a little harder on this issue of the future of multilateralism. I fully understand the Canadian exasperation and obsession with Donald Trump. But the rest of the world, or much of the rest of the world, is, is, is facing the same kinds of issues and responses. And it would seem to me that creates some interesting potential opportunities for Canada to think about a new role of building alliances on certain kinds of issues. And so as you think of this idea of a new multilateral moment, when East, West, and South is all frustrated deeply with the president and raising fundamental questions as our Canadians about the future of US reliability. Are there specific tools or approaches or areas of policy that could be especially ripe for a new era of multilateralism where Canada would not follow but would actually be in the lead, taking advantage of this time? It's. Um it's perhaps something that you could whisper in the ear of the Prime Minister's office. Uh, David yesterday was lamenting the, the lack of a, a Plan B. And um, maybe a Plan B exists and we just don't know about it. But uh, that, that's an excellent Plan B that could be a Plan A, given Trudeau's um, uh, international reputation, notwithstanding the India visit. Um, He's, it's still a pretty lustrous international personality. And uh, to go that route um, makes a lot of sense. It's very much in the Canadian tradition and could be done in, uh, in areas such as refugees and climate change. However, wouldn't, if you were whispering in the ear of the Prime Minister on one side, wouldn't somebody else be saying, don't bother the Donald. Don't lead. Canadians have always been very reluctant to lead. Canadians don't like the spotlight much. Now, there are times, international environmental um, initiatives in, in the 1980s, um, when Canadian diplomats have played an, an enormous role um, Pearson in, in um, 1956. 
But on the whole, we don't, we don't lead. Uh, it's a great idea. Let's do it. Dave? Canada, in particular, has boxed itself into a corner, uh, working so closely with the U.S. that it no longer has an engagement with several countries with whom we should be properly engaged, namely Russia and Iran. Um, and as long as Freeland is foreign minister, I'm convinced that that will, that will remain so. Uh, she's arguably the one who has taken Canada into a hardline American position, despite all her reluctance to claim Otherwise, the, the, I mean, she wants to be a multilateralist while also pursuing deeper integration with the U.S. Absent her, like put a Stephen Dion in her place, no, no longer possible. We might have seen that rapprochement with Russia. But arguably, the global problems that really need uh, addressing are ones in which Russia, China, Iran even, and other countries uh, with whom we don't work too closely anymore must be engaged, uh, whether it's the refugee crisis, uh, whether it's uh, climate change, we need to bring the middle powers, the BRICS and the others into the game. Uh, G7 doesn't cut anymore, it's almost irrelevant. Charlevoix demonstrated that. Uh, G20 is arguably that, the, the instrument that could take us into the new era. You need leadership to show uh, resolve that we're willing to discuss and engage with countries like Russia. Uh, that's not possible under the current Canadian government uh, policy. Um, unfortunately, with sanctions being in place and so on. You could blame the Russians for that, but I think we've found, we've, we've boxed ourselves into a corner. Uh, we have no diplomatic relations with that country, or very uh, insufficient, despite sharing a border with them, having problem with Arctic, Arctic sovereignty and management of the, Ar the Arctic, which we share. So, uh, you know, part of the issue here is, uh, self-created environment which we're too dependent on the U.S. and we see the G7 as the, the, the fulcrum of power whereas in fact we need to bring new players into the, into, into the discussion. Whether they're democracies or not, that's a separate question. Well, and the G20 is in some respects a, a Canadian intervention or at least there was a, a big Canadian input in, into it. Um, is so clear is that what, what seems to be so clear is that there is no fundamental new thinking in Canadian foreign policy and hasn't been for a long time. There's liberal internationalism and what Richard yesterday called liberal continentalism. And uh, those, are the, those are the two poles of, of Canadian foreign policy. And, and I don't see anyone, apart from you, David, um, thinking outside that box. And maybe it's time to, to think that way. And maybe, maybe it's time for uh, a Canada Among Nations, which takes us along that road. Um, Richard Imogene from Carleton. Uh, this is actually probably more to David, but I, I was just wondering, uh, you know, we were talking in our workshop about all the moves that the Trudeau government has done to try to appease Trump and get on board, um, why wouldn't, could they think out of the box and actually say, let's work with Russia? I know there's the Freeland dimension, but other people in the, in the government or in the bureaucracy might be more disposed, and, and that would presumably curry favor with Trump. So I don't know, I'm just wondering. Well, it may be, uh, since, since there's the call to, uh, to, to be more flexible and more resilient, it may be that Trump is not wrong about Russia. He may be, he may be not wrong for the wrong reasons, but, um, but it's, um, it's a case that can be made that, that, that Russia is, um, is worth engaging with. So I, I have to bring this to a close. A discussion, though, that I 
I feel we don't have enough in Washington. Maybe it's because Canadian foreign policy seems secondary or is crowded out by too much of the Trump phenomenon. But I hope that we, this isn't the last time we have this conversation and that many of you will be with us for our future iterations. The book is available. Um, the gentleman in the purple tie in the back can help you to purchase a book for $40 if you would like, if you have cash. Otherwise, we'll talk. Um, and I would like to ask you for one last thing. Please join me in thanking Richard Madden and Norman Hilmer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm going to pick up the camera. Oh. Oh.